design a ranking model for the Instagram feed. Okay, thank you so much for being here today, Rikram. Uh, can you quickly introduce yourself to our viewers? Yeah, definitely. Um, my most recent experience has been as a machine learning engineer uh, working at Meta, uh, sp specializing specifically on ranking and recommendation systems. Uh, previously, before that, I've been a, a software engineer and a machine learning for quite a while uh, across a wide variety of technologies and industries. Okay, amazing. It sounds like you have the perfect background for answering the question that we're going to talk about today then. So let's get right into it. So our question today is, design a ranking model for the Instagram feed. Great. Thank you, Angie, for the question. I'm just going to quickly write it out as well so I have <clears throat> something to type it and look at and use as a reference as we go along. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, Instagram. So design an Instagram feed ranking model. Mm -hmm. All right, so before we jump into the actual design of, of the of the items, what I typically want to do is uh, run through to recognize what who are the actors, what are the what does the system expect to do, what are some of the business requirements, and uh, where and how some of those business requirement, requirements can be translated into machine learning models, uh, which is where our thrust of uh, <clears throat> the conversation will be. So... Uh, basically, what, what, from what I understand, and please feel free to correct me or, or you know, uh, refocus our attention on things that are important, uh, a, a, a media platform like you know, Instagram, where you actually go into the homepage, you actually see a bunch of uh, uh, posts that are suggested to, to you as a user. And at, at the very top, what I see is like a suggested posts from friends that I'm connected to on, on the platform. And then subsequent to that, there are su uh, suggested posts that are uh, that are ranked based on um, a ranking algorithm. And we, if I understand correctly, are concerned about that particular ranking. What are the posts that are from non-connected people that uh, that would be of interest to me? And that possibly would lead to a, a higher engagement, me liking the post, commenting on the post, and so on and so forth. Am I on the right page as what you intend for us to design? Yeah, exactly. Um, so... We're trying to focus on like suggested posts, so the, those might be various content creators that the users not necessarily following, but also, of course, uh, it could be people who they're like tangentially connected to. I see. <clears throat> Great. Uh, and uh, from a business perspective, I assume, and this is based on my <clears throat> my understanding, the the business is interested in improving the engagement of me as the as the viewer uh, with these content, so that that way. It, in some yeah. way or shape or form, it actually contributes to session or the daily active user within the platform. Am I right on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it'd be interesting to talk about some metrics, both at like a high level and also at an individual le level that you'd like to measure. Right. <clears throat> uh, improve DAO or sessions. Uh, engagement for the viewer. Okay, great. Um, all right, so uh, that's just laying <clears throat> laying out um, what would be the metrics of interest to the uh, to the uh, to the organization. Um, so uh, one of the things that I want to mention here is as if we're looking to employ some sort of a machine learning model to be able to move this metric uh, that's of interest to the organizational team, uh, what we, however, would be working on would be at the level of an individual as opposed to the gross metric which is aggregated over the entire community or the entire user base. So as a, if we were focusing on the machine learning model, what, it, what we would be designing is an objective function that is in some way aligned with the, the overarching uh, metric of intent for the, uh, for the organization or the team. <clears throat> so we'll assume that somehow we have teased out some sort of an objective that can be used by a machine learning model that will be contributive to the actual uh, machinery, actual uh, metric of interest to the uh, to the business. So ML objective is aligned. Let's assume with the uh, business motive, uh, which typically is something along the right lines of DAO sessions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so uh, and and here ML objective in the, in the case specifically talking about a, a <clears throat> an Instagram user would be. Uh, something along the lines of viewing the uh, content, um, content, uh, engaging with the content, which could be liking, commenting, and so engaging, <clears throat> commenting, and so, so 
So those are the activities that I see uh, happening on the machine learning model uh, or machine machinery that we're going to build to be able to do that. So this is just you know, giving a quick rundown on what, what what's involved in in terms of uh, core quote unquote functional requirements, right? So this is just getting the context for the functional requirement. Yeah. Um, a context. quick clarification question there. When you say that the ML objective is aligned with the business motive, are you saying that you're directly optimizing for those metrics or are you optimizing something that should be correlated with those metrics? Yes, we are. Uh, we are the objective is correlated to the eventual business, uh, business metric. Oh, right? DAU. So, okay, we so are, you're not like directly yeah. optimizing like DAU or a number of sessions, for example. Exactly. We wouldn't directly be <clears throat> attempting to optimize DAU because that's daily mm -hmm. uh, active user count. We, we're not looking at the gross metric. We're looking at the right. individual objective that we can act on on a particular individual so that it'll contribute to the DAU. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Right. And typically the way we do that is by virtue of data scientists having studied this, we find uh, activities or actions by individuals which are contributive to the overall uh, uh, <clears throat> metric of interest. The the other uh, item I want to mention here in, is in terms of, um, and this is uh, trying to get to a machinery that would be able to predict and 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 contribute to this overall uh, overall metric. The other thing uh, we want to also focus on and pay attention to a little bit would be uh, on the non-functional side, which is looking at the scale of the system. So it's scalable uh, is one thing. Uh, and it's uh, available would be another thing. Uh, and, uh, and, and in order to concretize some of these, maybe some estimations of numbers would be helpful as well. Uh, and that typically uh, in, in, in uh, social, media con social media of this nature that's globally present, the numbers could be quite large. And I'm going to take a few quick stabs at some of these um, daily active user count, you know, maybe in the order of a few hundred, I think it possibly is in the range of like 500 million or so uh, for Instagram and perhaps even more. Um, I'm going to pause there and see whether you have any, you know, thoughts, questions and so on. Uh, I'm just enumerating some of the items that come to my mind at this time uh, in terms of non-functional and estimations. Uh, yeah, that makes fun sense to me so far. And I assume we're going to get to functional requirements later then. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go back and, and, and see what more is to be, what more needs to be added on the functional. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, on the functional, uh, I want to make sure that we get this right in terms of uh, the specific objective of the machinery. So, we want to build a machinery, an ML model that gets uh, that improves individual engagement. And that's the core of our uh, functional requirement. And though here, the engagement could be just viewing the content, the post, or liking the post, or commenting on the post. And that's the core function of the ML model that we're attempting to build. The non-functional, as we stated, is that it, it, it'd be scalable, available. Uh, and um, yeah, I think those are the two key things that come to my mind. Um, and the estimation was just to support that non-functional uh, understanding of the non-functional functional requirement. Non -functional requirement. Uh, if there's, um, do you have anything more we need to uh, set out here or establish here before we move on to perhaps looking at uh, what would be involved in the entire building out an entire ML pipeline, training and so on and so forth? Uh, or do you want me to proceed? Yeah, so I'm curious for the non-functional requirements, um, or I guess you could put this under functional, maybe like if you would think about incorporating any sort of um, tooling for this ranking system. Mm, that's that's a good point. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, typically, yes, we do want to have want to look at analytics uh, uh, tooling, specifically maybe along the lines of debugability, uh, <clears throat> monitorability monitoring. Um, uh, and uh, in general, uh, ML ops related you know, al alerts and warnings, right? If there are uh, mm -hmm. operations, ML ops alerts and warnings when we have exceeded or <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, exceeded certain thresholds on a number of uh, poor uh, 
features or, or the feature coverage has not been appropriate enough and so on and so forth. So uh, you're right, definitely need some ML ops related uh, tooling available. Uh, what I, what we may not be truly interested, uh, at least based on what I what I see in this description in this description so far, gathered is perhaps uh, how do we monetize something like this, right? Uh, a lot of social media is monetized based on commercials that are shown, which are also embedded into the uh, into the feed, like Instagram feed. But we are not directly looking at that. But that would be a non-functional requirement should we, you know, choose to at some point. Yeah, I would agree. That's out of scope for now. Okay. Uh, and in terms of analytics, you know, just want to quickly lay out a few things that may be of interest would be uh, something along the lines of, <clears throat> you know, who, who are the most popular content creators geographically, how are they distributed uh, or what are the trending uh, posts and things of that nature that may be of interest from the side of Instagram uh, administrator, right? Or a data scientist. Um, anyway, that, that, Let's not get bogged in that, but that that would be the, some of the things that I think uh, would be of interest typically. Okay, perfect. So this looks like a great place to start. I'm curious where you would go next now that you've gathered like the basic requirements. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> what I want to uh, look uh, down now a, a bit more deeply is to see um, what are the features available to be uh, mm -hmm. to uh, proceed creating something like this. Um, mm -hmm. And you know how do we build a, a machinery to 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 accomplish this task? But before I do that, I just want to quickly lay out my thinking based on what you know, what I understand of uh, if a, a feed ranking uh, a system like this. So typically, a system like this would involve at least three different phases. So it's not like one machinery or one model, and we are essentially building a pipeline uh, and not just so much a a, a single model. And the pipeline involves three stages, a candidate generation stage, uh, a, 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 <clears throat> a ranking stage, and then finally a post-processing stage. Uh, and this is uh, how typically things are done within the industry, right? Now, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, each of these stages, the, the, the input would be the, the previous stage. Uh, for the candidate generation stage, you know, we, uh, so in order to perform the candidate generation stage, there are certain contraptions that would, ha would have to have been constructed and be ready for, available for us. Uh, for the ranking stage, the output from the candidate generation stage is consumed, and then we finally apply some post-processing, which is typically uh, things along the nature of you know, fairness, diversity, and, uh, and freshness of content, and so on. Um, Anyway, uh, what I want to take a step back from what, what I showed you here as being the overarching pipeline and perhaps look at the, the data that, that is available, which is the data slash features that would be available in order for us to construct something like this. Um, and give me one second here. Right, candidate generation. Great. Um, d uh, before I jump into going through the data and what sorts of, uh, what categories of data we look at, is there anything at all you wanted to talk about? Any comments you want to make? Uh, only just one quick question. So for this post-processing stage, you mentioned like fairness and diversity and so on. So overall, is post-processing meant to sort of like change the list of candidates that you've ranked? Or are you like adding things in? Like what, what does it consist of exactly? Oh, good question. Uh, post-processing typically consists of, <coughs> excuse me, re-ranking or reshuffling the candidates that we have found. Um, okay. In, in such a way that, so if I have 10 candidates show, post shown on my feed, and let's say the 10th candidate is perhaps someone, uh, something that is required for the listing to be more fair in some sense, uh, we would uh, boost it up to perhaps position number three, or things of that nature. Of course, I'm giving you only a, you know, assuming there is 10 candidates, but typically what we want to do is something along the lines of candidate generation would generate around 1,000 candidates uh, who the ranking system would rank, and then we would subsequently uh, post-process some of them in place to, you know, to have more visibility or less visibility. So the short answer to your question is, uh, uh, we're not generating new candidates in post-processing, we're reshuffling re their appearance or their presence. Okay, cool, sounds good. So I'd love to hear more about this data pipeline then. Yep. So uh, the, in, in general, we want to gather features for the viewer, uh, the Instagram, Instagram viewer, the Instagram post, 
Uh, we also uh, want to gather features uh, of the viewer's interaction history. And this is interaction history with post or content. And you know, additionally, we also want to gather a viewer interaction history uh, in their social uh, network in the sense that in the, uh, in the connected content they have with other, uh, other uh, uh, viewers, uh, meaning not necessarily content creators, but other uh, folks who they are connected to in the, in the network. So these are the general overarching categories of features that one would look at. Specifically, if we look at each of these categories, uh, what would be of interest uh, would be a crude, uh, I should call it aggregated, aggregated and delayed uh, features. Um, an aggregated feature, an example would be something along the lines of what has been my engagement for the past seven days? What is the number of uh, uh, likes in the past seven days? It's just, just an example. And, and uh, I picked seven out of thin air. Uh, it's conceivable one can have this for varying windows. You can have it for one day, two days, five days, seven days, 28 days, and so on and so forth. And we also want delayed features that are features that <clears throat> typically are um, have to do with historical interactions, something along the lines of what was my interaction a week back? Uh, what was my like count uh, 14 days back? And so on and so forth. So this gives us a, uh, this hopefully captures quite a bit of richness in terms of the viewer itself. Uh, and and the trajectory right. of you know, what they've gone gone through, uh, right? Yeah, yep. and I like this idea of the aggregated features because it smooths the interactions over time, essentially. Mm. Absolutely right. Uh, and then similarly for the posts, uh, we could have something along the same lines. But here, the post men, the post uh, it, it itself dir directly may not contain much more much details, uh, although it it could. Uh, we also would be interested in the post creators. Um, so the, the content creators, post creators, uh, features, uh, how well connected are they, the number of the number of people who follow their content and so on and so forth. And in terms of post, typically one could imagine uh, a post being parsed into video, audio, uh, and text, and we could gather embeddings for each one of these for video portion, audio, and text and then gathering those would be helpful as well um, and then uh, what has been the 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 historical engagement of people uh, meaning uh, viewers against this post in terms of the, the number of engagement number of number of likes that it, ha it has accrued in the last three days four days and so on and so forth so uh, something that parallels what we spoke of here right aggregated and delayed features a parallel to okay. that for uh, for uh, for the post itself. Um, okay. Uh, now, and yeah. Can you give me slightly more detail about what these embeddings are? Like, do they come from some type of pre-trained model, or are they collected from other sources of data? Right. Uh, so uh, specifically, um, embeddings can be created from other pre-trained uh, pre-trained models. Uh, embeddings for video, embeddings for audio, <clears throat> embeddings for text can be collected from pre-trained models. Uh, running these posts again to, against a pre-trained pre model would give us these embeddings. Typically, they are vectors of certain sizes that we have chosen to. Uh, to uh, you know, they could be in the hundreds, uh, depending on what exactly you choose. Sometimes it's like, like typically you, we see vectors of the size of 786 floating uh, numbers, floating point numbers. Uh, again, the sizes are very much dependent on the architectures and the size of the models that are used to create these embeddings. Mm -hmm. uh, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, sure. OK, so the plan then is to get these from pre-trained models. Yes, that is one source. Uh, that is one mm -hmm. source of uh, for embeddings. OK. OK. Um, we could we could also um, uh, generate embeddings. Uh, so one source. Uh, we, we could also, in our <clears throat> own uh, machinery that we're going to build, uh, be, be able to construct these embeddings as a, as a consequence of the architecture we choose. And I'll get to that in a little bit when I get to 
uh, a two tower mo- mo- uh, model that I, I am thinking of uh, using for 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 this particular problem. Okay, okay sure. Uh, so um, that's uh, just gathering d- uh, data and fe- features features here, not so much data because there what what else need, what else could happen uh, in terms of uh, when a person interacts with a, a post. So that's when we then generate label labels. Um, and labels are a delayed signal. Uh, it is it's delayed with respect to the fact that an impression happens today on my uh, on my Instagram feed. Uh, I choose to uh, react or respond to that or react to that uh, maybe a day after, maybe a week after. So the labels are available only after the fact or whether I liked it, whether I forwarded it, whether I commented about it and so on. So this is another part of the data that that has to be captured. And I'm going to separate this out into a different line. So you could say data being, uh, features being a part of uh, data. Uh, this is interaction. Did I like it, view it, etc. And these could be binary labels, right? This could be zero of not having an interaction. I'm going to talk about how we get a zero in a little bit. Uh, one would be a positive interaction, meaning I actually engaged with the content, with this particular mm-hmm. action. Okay. Uh, and it's what is difficult typically is to gather a zero label. Because the zero, how do you, how do we know that someone hasn't uh, <clears throat> reacted to a post or responded to a post and so on? Well, the only way to gather that is to to uh, enforce on our, upon ourselves a threshold uh, after which we discount any other any other inter- any interactions. So this requires that we uh, <clears throat> put forth some sort of a threshold up until which we gather positive labels meaning one, label one, right? Um, um, all right. Uh, so w- th- th- these are the overarching features that one can think of. Typically, you know, if we are inclined to look at this uh, a little bit uh, mathematically, some, something along the lines of uh, a tuple, X, A, R, P is what we're gathering, where X is the vector of uh, features, uh, a is the uh, a is the uh, action that is uh, that has been recorded. Um, uh, actually, A is the action that has been recommended. R is the reward, and P is the probability. And I'll explain that in a second. Uh, oops, that's not what I meant. Okay, X is a rep- X is the features. Uh, a is the action recommended. And R is the reward, um, B is the probability. And it, we may not immediately see what this tuple is at this point of data gathering, but this becomes evident once we start looking at uh, how the model is eventually deployed and, and, and served in, in the real life. Uh, for now, we have just looked at what the X features are. Um, the reward is closely related to the action that was taken by the by the view by the viewer, right? So if I choose to have an engagement, it would be a one. Otherwise, it'd be a zero. Okay. And the PE probability has to do with serving time. Once we have built a machinery, we would be able to gather this pre number for the probability of the machinery recommending the, the uh, recommending this particular uh, likelihood of this particular X feature resulting in an engagement. But we'll skip that for now. Uh, I just want to. Uh, Make sure that we go on to the next step that we would we should be covering, uh, which would be talking a little bit more detail about what this candidate generation ranking and post processing mean for us to serve, and as well as what it means for us when in terms of uh, model training and model building. If that's okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the model architecture then. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, uh, <clears throat> What we need to do in, in, in the survey at serving time is to be able to generate candidates. And the way to generate candidates at serving time would be to specifically be, uh, for th- this sort of a problem of recommendation would be to actually use what is known as uh, approximate near, nearest neighbor. Uh, in order to compute <clears throat> approximate nearest neighbor, we need to 
compute uh, embeddings for viewers and posts. So again, uh, I'm talking about the candidate generation phase of uh, the, the, the pipeline, okay? Uh, so in order to uh, be able to uh, compute the, uh, uh, compute the, the, the thousand ranked uh, candidate posts for this current viewer, thousand posts for the current viewer, uh, we want to use an approximate nearest neighbor logic or, or algorithm. And in order to do that, we need to first off uh, generate some sort of an embedding. And this is where uh, the earlier embedding conversation came up and we, we, we tie those two together. Uh, and then once we have identified those uh, candidates, the thousand candidate posts for this particular viewer, we can rank them based on the uh, based on the uh, probability of engagement that they, 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 they would entail. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the task now would be to look at a machinery or build a machinery that would allow us to learn the embeddings, right? And the way to do that, there are a few, two different te te technique, tactics or techniques used. Uh, one is um, uh, a collaborative filtering technique. The second is a, a two-tower uh, network technique of learning this. I'm going to spend a few minutes on each of these, and uh, and, and 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 I'll tell you which one I, I would personally prefer for you know if several reasons. Uh, here, very quickly for collaborative filtering technique, what we are essentially doing is constructing a. If I can move this. Uh, then copy paste. Let me move this two tower thing away. Okay. Come on. Oh, I can't click on. Uh, I'm gonna open a new uh, new uh, what do you call it? Um, can I do that? Oh yeah, create new uh, board. So I do not, I don't have the text and the diagrams mixed together. Somehow it doesn't make me. Yeah, sure. Let, let me do that. Yeah. So let me do this. Uh, where is this? this is not really good. Let me copy this. Paste this. And then uh, another one. What I'm attempting to show you here is are three boxes. Uh, essentially, uh, along the top row, if I can, text, where is it? Or post items. Post items. Along the top row, along the columns. And here are uh, viewers. So this might be an example might be John. Another might be Amy. Here, post items. Here, example might be post number seven. An example here is post number number nine. And what we're capturing in this matrix is a one or a zero corresponding to each of these. And uh, that indicates like a signal of whether that, there was engagement. Exactly. That indicates whether there was a, a, a engagement or not. As you can imagine very quickly, this, this is, by the way, part of uh, me attempting to elaborate on uh, a collaborative filtering technique. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of learning and embedding. So you, as you can imagine, and I haven't gotten to the other two boxes, as you can imagine, this is already a sparse matrix. Why? Because the number of engagements in comparison to the number of available posts is very sparse. I might only engage with a handful at, at best, you know, on a daily basis or even accrued over time. Uh, what, what I have on this, on this box on the right-hand side 
or would be <coughs> viewer features. Uh, so if I look at across the line, across the row, for John, I would have, let's say, John's age maybe, and John's uh, 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 latitude, longitude somehow coded in as a, as a, as a number that can be used. Uh, maybe uh, uh, the viewer features, whatever, fundamental features of the viewer, or it could be historical aggregated features of the viewer as well. Number of views to post or number of likes to post in the past week, things of that nature. So things of that nature can be coded up in here on the on the on the um, on the extension table on the right hand side. On the bottom, in the bottom, what we can do here would be post features, right? So in here we have post number seven. What is the what what, what is the feature for post number seven? Maybe the number of likes in the past week. So maybe that was one hundred. Uh, number of uh, <clears throat> number of reposts or number of um, likes, uh, number of, sorry, uh, comments. And that may be, say, 20. Things of that nature. So there would be a long string of post features appending, added on to this column. Uh, there would be a long list of uh, viewer features added on to the row. Uh, now, this, mat uh, this matrix, call it a matrix A, can be decomposed into a a user matrix and a and a I think it's called user matrix and the item matrix v dot transpose and that's the essential nature of collaborative filtering. What we're doing is we're trying to approximate this matrix A and uh, and uh, uh, factorize that into two different matrices of smaller dimension. And if we look at this closely, uh, A would be of dimension m by n, where m is the number of users. Uh, n is the number of posts that we have gathered together to form this, construct this uh, table, whereas u would be of the dimension m by d, and v would be of the dimension uh, d, uh, v transpose, so n by d. Okay. Now what we have done effectively in this, in this method of looking at the problem is we have, uh, we have uh, found a lower dimensional representation of users and post items into a d-dimensional space. Uh, and in the act of doing that, we have approximated the, the, the interaction matrix. And that's the idea between, uh, behind collaborative filtering. And the way to do that yeah. really is to actually apply regular rises and so on and so forth. But I'm going to stop here. Uh, see, uh, before I jump into the, the two-tower network and how we could learn embeddings off of that, I'm going to stop here and see whether you have any questions or any course corrections we need to do in this conversation. Yeah. Uh, not for now. I guess, so in summary, it seems like the intuition behind this is that um, in A, you're trying to approximate all of the interactions via like the similarity between the viewer, uh, the viewer vector, the d-dimensional vector, and the post vector, right? That's, that's correct. So now let's quickly uh, spend a few seconds talking about the, the two-tower network, which is, which is slightly preferred uh, in, in contemporary uh, in, in the industry right now, because it's uh, especially given that collaborative filtering re requires some sort of an alternating lead square mechanism for matrix factorization. And uh, in the case of large data, that may not always be feasible or may always be uh, uh, pertinent. So uh, in a two tower network, essentially what we have two towers of a towers to a uh, neural net. Uh, and I'm going to make it rather uh, easy on myself Oops, like this and quickly draw out just the, the outlines of it. Uh, this is the viewer tower, and this is the post item tower. What we feed in here are would be the features of the viewer, the sparse and the dense features of the viewer. And I should call this tower. And the post item tower the input would be the post item features. Okay. Uh, what would come out of these two would be uh, M, what we restrict ourselves to an output that is of size D to represent our D output units on both the viewer uh, and the post item. Can move this. Uh, 
And then finally, we have a, a sigmoid layer here, which allows us to take the dot product of these two and compute a sigmoid on the sigmoid function here. And that gives us uh, a, a probability like number between zero and one. So this is the, the essential idea uh, between, uh, behind a two tower network. What do we fe feed in? A viewer set of features, post set of features, and we run it through two independent towers, generate D, D layer output, take a dot product, take a sigmoid. The output becomes uh, a number between zero and one. And we compare this against the label. We have a label of a zero one, and we use binary cross entropy loss as the loss function, and we appropriately adjust the weights in the in these in these networks based on what what's the loss that we encounter, and progressively this network learns better and better weights so as to approximate what what what's seen as the labels, and in having done that now we have learned two towers independent towers that can independently be used to learn or present the embeddings for a new user, and that's the uh, the uh, the idea behind a two tower network. In order to train this, uh, <clears throat> so I think I quickly write down, we would have a a binary cross entropy loss, and uh, we could use uh, any sort of machinery for training a deep network, stochastic gradient descent, uh, <clears throat> any of the optimizers, Adam optimizer, and so on and so forth, to be able to train something like this, uh, and that gives us embedding as an outcome. Uh, when we pass in a, an individual user, you can get an embedding as the outcome from that. Yeah, um, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I like that the high-level intuition of this approach is very similar to the last one, where we're just trying to come up with these d-dimensional vectors or embeddings representing the viewer and the item and just learning the similarity between the two. Exactly. Uh, the, the next thing I want to quickly talk about in the interest of time is to go on to uh, how we uh, tra train these models. The first one, collaborative filtering, we're going to put it aside for now. Uh, but in this case, what we need to be cautious of is that we have uh, adequate samples of positive and negative labeled data points of viewer post-item interactions. In order to do that, we can mm -hmm. use several techniques to do that. Uh, you know, we want to say if you, we, we have 500 million positive examples, we want to do some negative sampling and, and fetch 500 million negative uh, samples, which means no interaction samples. And that thus our machinery is learning the correct embedding that predicts the engagement of uh, engagement likelihood as opposed to the inherent bias in the data. So that's a very key important step to be taken here in terms of uh, preparing data for the training itself. In terms of and when, um, you, say, when you say negative samples, do you mean simply posts that haven't been uh, interacted with the user yet, or are you referring specifically to? maybe like posts that have been presented on the feed to the user, but the user didn't interact. The posts that did not uh, encounter a positive interaction, meaning no likes, no views, uh, no <clears throat> whatever is the engagement metric that we want to use, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, is it conditioned upon that post having shown up on the user's feed before? Yes. These are all conditioned on uh, uh, posts having shown up on the user's feed before. Okay, great. Yeah. Because that is what we would want to see. That is the person yeah. likely to engage given that. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that makes more sense. So, uh, right. <clears throat> and a machinery like this, we know uh, this uh, machinery has come up to a, a, a good maturity in terms of training. Once we look at the, the actual losses, uh, of, uh, not the losses, actual uh, uh, accuracy metrics, or we look at the AUC curve of this. So remember, or, or if you, as you may know, this is a classification problem now because we are predicting label zero or one. Now you can plot AUC plots uh, area under the curve of the ROC mm -hmm. of the ROC curve, and that is something that we can use to uh, as a, use as a gauge to see how well this model is, uh, is performing in terms of being able to predict the labels. Uh, is typically, we can use something along the lines of eighty percent as a number as a gating number to say, okay, is this model good enough? I've seen in various groups and various teams, this being number being varying anywhere anywhere from 60% to 80%, but definitely it has to be greater than 50% because 50% is the, the random line, like, like flipping a coin. Okay, anyway, perfect. <clears throat> having done this, the next thing we could, uh, I want to talk about is going back to the pipeline again, 
uh, if I can, if I may. How do I do that? I thought it was available in this. All my files, I think. Uh, nope, not here. Nope. Yes. Uh, in the in the pipeline, what we now can look at is the uh, is past the is is that the candidate generation. How do we generate candidates now? Well, it's very simple now because we have we have given a particular <clears throat> user. We can run the user through the two tower network, and we'll get an embedding for the user. So this is a new user who has come onto the system, and then we simply do what is known as approximate nearest neighbors, which is in a nearest neighbor algorithm, much like you know, uh, KNN, K nearest neighbors. You explore nearest neighbors, pick 1,000 of the nearest neighbors, and these 1,000 neighbors are the neighboring viewers, I mean, neighboring post items form our 1,000 candidates. Mm -hmm. okay. Then we run through ranking, uh, which is we go back to the machinery that we have built and which is the two tower. We have 1,000 candidates. We have the current viewer sitting here. Take all 1,000 of them one at a time and produce this label, produce this prediction. The higher the prediction number, the higher likely, the more likely that this person is to engage. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then that use that number to sort these uh, candidates in descending order. And that forms our ranking. Okay. Okay. And then... We uh, yeah, and then we go into post processing, in which we can apply uh, hand, you know, uh, hand edited rules that say certain types of content or certain types of viewers have to be promoted, or certain types of posts have to be promoted higher or lower within the uh, within the uh, within the result set. Uh, okay, so now that you have this final ranking, uh, how do you feel about moving on to evaluation of that ranking? Right, <clears throat> the there are a few things to do. One, uh, as I mentioned, was something along the lines of plotting the AUC curve and so on in, <clears throat> in training itself, looking at those metrics. And we are also, in, while in preparing the data, we also have <clears throat> validation data that is prepared separately. And we look at the validation data uh, and see uh, how, how does the validation data set perform uh, in, in terms of the same metric, AUC, ROC curves, and so on. That's one, one dating before we actually unleash this model. The, the, the next step to do is we want to run an A-B test to a limited controlled fraction of users in the real life, in, in production systems. So that means a, a portion of users are shown, a portion of controlled users are shown the existing system, a portion of a similar number of users are shown the this new, uh, new model that we built based on the uh, candidate generation uh, uh, ranking and uh, post-processing pipeline. Uh, and in this particular case, we would be looking at uh, the the outcome for those users who have been shown this new model or who have gone through this particular treatment to see whether they uh, engage more than the users who have who have not. And that would form our the basis of our A-B test. What we look at there in, in terms of metrics would be definitely, of course, the engagement numbers themselves, but now this is where we tie it back to the business objective. Does these folks who have gone through this new uh, uh, new uh, uh, mechanism ha yield a higher daily acti activity? So, for example, if you're looking at Dow, do they yield a highly daily active user? If that's the case, then this is a good model to promote up into production. Otherwise, uh, <clears throat> otherwise we do not. Uh, there are a few things to mention here. In addition, just to the Dow. We also want to look at some of the safeguard metrics in our in our uh, in our system. So, for example, a safeguard metric might be some, something along the lines of: uh, Do I get uh, a higher number of reports? As in, there are posts sometimes that people report, or posts that cause a a viewer to block the content creator, and things of that nature. If that numbers, these are safeguard metrics. If those numbers are elevated or increasing, then possibly th there is a uh, there is a skew or bias in this model, and that this may not be a good candidate to promote the production. Does that answer your question? Yeah, totally. 
Um, okay, so I think this is a great place to pause because I thought this is a really fantastic solution. Uh, and I'd love to hear from you, like, what do you think, if you were the interviewer, what do you think went well? And what do you think you would have wanted to change or add? As an interviewer, I would have uh, loved to see a much more rapid pace at which we would we could have arrived here. And then a the second thing is um, uh, be able to see the actual um, serving pipeline, which means uh, mm-hmm. what would we do in real life? So in order to be able to serve this model out to, out to production and how we can do mm-hmm. some sort of a online learning as well. So the, this model is continuously learning based on newer data that comes in. Um, because yeah. non-stationarity is a, is a problem within you know, in the industry in terms of user interaction and so on, how we can do, see that. That would be something I would have loved to see. Yeah, uh, overarching, definitely. Yeah, I was quickly going to say, yeah. uh, and overall, I think we covered the basis, basis, basics of uh, the, the functional requirements. Uh, there are non-functional items that we couldn't get to, uh, which are things along the lines of you know, how, how can we ensure a scale uh, how can we distribute the computation, the learning, and perhaps even the serving to multiple servers and so on? Yeah, and that's already like a very difficult part of deploying a model, right? Like uh, a, a lot of times when we think about machine learning, we're thinking about just the model training and evaluating the model, and we haven't even gotten to uh, some of the more complicated parts of just like engineering a large scale machine learning system, you know? Um, but I also thought that in general, I was very impressed by how thorough and how well thought out your solution was. Uh, I really appreciated um, that you thought through so many details, like how after the ranking, there's extra post-processing where you might adjust uh, the ranking to account for like fairness or diversity. Uh, you talked about features that are not just from the current point in time, but are time smooth or lagged. Um, I also liked that you talked about different types of evaluation metrics beyond just accuracy. You know, um, whenever you have any sort of like possibly class imbalance system, it's great to check things like uh, AUC, ROC, and also things like safeguard metrics, which in a real world scenario um, are important to think about as well. Um, yeah, and then like one more thing I might add that if we had time to, it'd be cool to get to is uh, how do we solve the cold start problem? Uh, if a user has just joined Instagram and you don't know anything about their preferences or what kinds of posts that they might engage with, uh, how do you decide how to generate candidates and rank those candidates for them? Uh, what do you think? Yep, definitely. Th- th- those are valid points. Uh, specifically on the cold start, um, typically what is done is to supply these candidates, these viewers rather, with posts that are popular and see how they yeah. react to the <clears throat> to react yeah. to them. Uh, that's typically what is what I've seen uh, done in the industry. Yeah, that's like a great, great play. It's a great way to do it. Uh, okay, so thank you so much for teaching us so much today about ranking. I think we've learned a lot from this interview, and hopefully, we'll have some more up- upcoming content on ranking and machine learning. Uh, thank you for being here, Vikram, and thanks everybody for watching. Mm-hmm.